All right. A quick recap of what we talked about last class. Um, so we were basically looking at computing the centroid for irregular shapes. Still not very irregular, but it's not uh, like a, a rectangle or a square anymore. Okay. We started with a symmetric shape. That's what a hull would look like. And then uh, we, we did some examples on how to, if we have a simple straight line, how does all of this go into our computations? And we did all of this analytically, but you can do this numerically as well. And today we'll do some examples with an actual, uh, a simplified hull shape using numerical integration. All right, and there we were computing the area moments of inertia Ix and Iy. And that's, that's basically where we had stopped. So let me uh, point out, this example is pretty straightforward and very simple. Let, let's do one more, which is slightly more involved. And, and let's see how it's, um, how it changes things very, very slightly, right? So, uh, I forgot to ask, do you have any questions about the homework? Um, I'll, I'll assign uh, homework two very soon. And uh, I looked at the dates for the quiz. Um, hmm. Is it okay if we push it back one class? So you will have time to do uh, enough time to do homework two, and I can give you the solution. No problem with me. Okay. Any anybody else has a problem? All right, so I'll, I'll put the announcement on Canvas and um, instead of next, uh, wait, I forgot when the quiz was. We'll just push it back one, one class. Um, all right, so let's do, uh, is this, oh wait, chat. <laughs> well, it's not, um, and somebody said thank you, but uh, you know, it, you still have to go through it. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, but it, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, don't worry. All right, so we have another example of X and Y. And this time we have a nice parabolic shape. So you, you see this, it, it's curved and it's more aligned with what a hull would look like. And uh, we say we want to integrate all the way up to here. Um, shape of the parabola is defined as, let's say, 4ax. And here we are given this coordinate is b. All right. So um, it's very easy to figure out that this location is x equals b. What is the y value? We just plug it into the equation here, right? 4ab square root. Square root of 4ab. And the first thing we'll compute for this is the area. Okay, and again, remember at any time you can always start with the very basic definition, double integral of dA. And think, let's think about what is dA. So this is, if we cut vertical strips, that's what dA would represent. Okay, and if we just keep simplifying this, it becomes dx times dy. 
And next thing we do need to do is put down the limits. It's always the same procedure. So X, let's see, X goes from zero to B. Y, Y doesn't go to a constant value. With each strip, the Y value keeps changing. And it depends on where my strip is located, what my X position of the strip is. So Y goes from zero to this four A, uh, square root of four AX. DX, DY. You, you can leave it as F of X, but yeah, or you can put down what, what it exactly is. Doesn't matter. Now, uh, again, remember um, X constant, constant. So we can leave this for the last Y constant on the lower limit, not a constant on the upper limit. That means we must do the integration in Y first. So we leave X alone, X equals zero to B. Integral of DY just becomes Y zero to square root of four AX. Okay, so just integrating in Y gives us this. And you can keep going, no need to, for us to do that here. So the inside would become square root of four AX and then you integrate X to the half. So it becomes X to three by two divided by three by two. All right. The other thing we talked about was how to find the centroid of this, shape, of this parabolic solid shape. So uh, since we are, have two coordinates, X and Y, you know that we would need two coordinates, X, C, and Y, C. Again, just start with the basic formula always. So you have double integral of X, uh, not X, C, X, D, A. Same thing, you expand it out, B, Y equals zero to square root of four A, X x dx dy and then again you can do the integration if you were doing the area moment of inertia about the x-axis y squared dA again follow the same thing over and over all, all you need to do correctly is set the limits once you do that, there's no more thinking involved. All right. Now, let think about this one question. Um, is it only feasible for me to cut vertical strips? So is that the only possibility? I cut many infinite number of vertical, small, tiny strips. Is there something else you might want to do? You can do horizontal. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, see, and uh, whenever you do mathematics, there's no one correct way of doing things. So instead of taking these vertical strips, I can cut this solid up into horizontal strip. The only thing that will influence is it will change what the limits look like and perhaps the inside. So let, let's um let's just um uh, illustrate how you would do that and um uh, so if we take horizontal strips instead And drawing sketches always helps uh, a lot when doing these things. So we have the same exact thing here. It's B and we cut this guy. A 
some arbitrary value y. And this width would be dy. Okay. See, when we cut vertical strips, we say it's this width of the guy is delta dx or delta x. When we do it in the other direction, it's the same thing. Instead of dx, we have a dy. Okay. And the coordinates are the same. This is b comma square root of 4ab. And, and remember, um, there's um, many different ways of looking at integration. So uh, one is you cut, let's say, 100 strips out of this solid and find the area of each individual strip, sum them all up, sum up all the 100 different values, and that's your total area, a good approximation for the total area. So if we think about what's the area of this, um, this cut, dA is equal to what? Can you think of what the area of this cut should be? What's the, uh, it, it's a rectangular strip. We know one dimension. What is the other dimension? Isn't it um, x dy? Uh, so you're, you're saying the one dimension we know is the, the height of this rectangle, right? This tiny rectangle. That's the dy that you said, right? Yes. Yeah, and the other uh, dimension that we don't know is this guy. That's the dimension that we don't know. It's B minus whatever the X coordinate of this position is, right? That's what we do. We go slowly along the curve that helps us cut all of these. So we start at zero and as we move along the curve, at this time, our X has some value and that means the strip length would be B minus X. So in this case, uh, DA is height times width, which is B minus X times DY. And when we integrate all of these in the Y direction, this is what we get. So area is Y going from zero all the way up to the top, which is square root of four AB, B minus X dy. This X is not constant. It depends on Y, okay? Remember the uh, curve looks like Y squared equal four AX. This implies that X is Y squared over 4A. So we can't leave the X in here. We, we have to just replace it with what it looks like in terms of Y. So it becomes Y equals zero to 4AB, B minus Y squared over 4A. And now that's, that's easy to do. That's a simple, uh, integral to evaluate. You can just do it separately. This becomes B times Y, this becomes Y cubed over three, once you integrate. Okay, so you can do it either way. This usually involves a bit more um, careful thinking. So it's perfectly fine to do it this way. Okay, so now uh, one more thing that, the last thing basically that, that might seem like a recap to you. Um, let's just 
quickly talk about the parallel access theorem. And this you've probably seen many, many times. We have the parallel access theorem. Um, so, all right, let me take uh, an object, let's say this, no, no, this is not good. All right, so this is pen, okay? Remember, whenever we talk about rotating objects, we have to specify what axis. So what axis can I rotate this pen about? Is there a particular axis I am obliged to rotate the pen about? There, there isn't, right? I can rotate it about the, yeah. say that once more. Well, I was going to say you have three axis of rotation, but they add to basically being, yeah, an infinite number of axis. Yeah, so there's three principal axes I can rotate it about. So I can take this pen and rotate it about the longitudinal axis or about this axis or about this axis, okay? So that's the three degrees of rotation. Um, but I'm not restricted to rotating this about the central axis, right? This. Uh, the, the rotation that's happening right now. I can very easily say the end of my pen is the rotation axis. So now it rotates about this axis, all right? Or the pen rotates about this axis. So now it'll do like uh, an orbit, okay? So there's an infinite number of possibilities of which axis you choose for the rotation. That's where parallel axis theorem comes into play. Um, it helps us connect the rotation about any arbitrary axis to the rotation about the center of, uh, well, the centroid of the object. Okay, so let's draw a sketch here. You have an object and we know it's centroid is somewhere here. We can rotate this we can rotate this object about the axis that passes through the centroid but that's not the only possibility, we, we, we might say, we want to rotate it about this other axis that's offset, but parallel, okay? So we call this, let's just give it some name, X, X prime, and let's say the perpendicular distance between these is some known value H. The parallel axis theorem just says um, I X prime is I X centroid plus A H squared. A here is the uh, area. I X represents area moment of inertia. About rotation axis passing through the centroid. Uh, 
I x prime is um, it's the area moment of inertia. about any arbitrary axis x prime, which is parallel to axis x. And I'm, I'm using x prime x. It could easily be y prime y, z prime z which is parallel to axis X and distance H away. Okay, so that, that's, that's the essence of the parallel axis theorem. It has to be parallel to the centroid axis that you compute the Mm, I X about. Any axis is valid if we're not talking about rotation about this axis, but about this axis, that's fine. But then this is not valid for this X prime. Our new prime axis would have to be offset, but parallel to the original axis. Okay. And uh, this is very useful when dealing with hulls because uh, let me draw, a, let's say a simple hull and it'll become very obvious. So this, this is what the top view of a hull water plane might look like. So uh, let's maybe call this top view of water plane. Remember what water plane is? It's basically wherever your hull is wetted, uh, the water that cuts through that section, well, that would imaginarily cut through the section. That area is called the water plane. And um, the uh, recall that the if you know the total length of the hull, you can say, all right, midway through is what we call the midships, uh, the amidships. So you can say, all right, I know my, I will locate my y axis at amidships. That's the symbol for amidships. And the x axis uh, points in the forward direction. Um, without knowing any mathematics, intuitively, where is the centroid of this? object of this area located? Le uh, well, tell me the obvious one, which, that you know exactly where, what, what the cent centroid coordinate is. There's two coordinates we have to think about, xc and yc. Which one do you know for sure? It'll be right on the x-axis. Okay, so since it's symmetric, we know the centroid has to lie on this line. Okay, what about the, so that means YC is equal to zero. That's the obvious one. What about XC? Does it lie to the right or to the left of amidships? It'll lie astern of midships. Yeah. Um, okay, so, mm, hmm, hmm, hmm. wait, wait, uh, yes. It'll lie aft of the uh, amidships because, um, well, I should have drawn this better. This doesn't, 
because the area is more uh, bulky in, in the aft compared to the fore, All right? So it would be slightly aft of the image. So let's see somewhere over here. And that, uh, remember that's what we call the LCF. So this is the LCF. Longitudinal center uh, of flotation. By definition, it's the centroid of the water plane area. Do you remember why this point is important? The LCF, what happens about this point? Doesn't the boat trim about that point? Yeah, all, all rotation will happen about axes that point pass through this point. So if we talk about uh, pitching motion or trimming, this all of this would happen about this axis. Okay. And we can label this Y uh, I don't want to call this Y C because that's Y centroid. Mm. Yeah. That, um, mm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wish I'd use different notation. So let me call this Y bar. Okay. Y bar. So the hull. This hull would trim or pitch about the Y bar axis. That passes through the LCF. Similarly, the heel, uh, heel or, or roll motion would happen about this X axis. We don't need to find any different axis because this already passes through the centroid or the LCF. For the Y axis, that's not the And this Y axis that we have taken here, it's a matter of convenience. You can put it down at amidships you can put it down at the forward perpendicular, or you can put it down at the aft perpendicular. Okay, um, so there's no restriction in doing all, any of that. This bar axis never moves. It always has to pass through the LCF. So there we don't have an option. All right. And um, so once we have all of this, since rotation happens about this axis, uh, we would need to compute I Y bar. Okay, so always, um, yeah, don't try to juggle this in your head. Always write down the formula first. So I equal I plus A H squared. Now we'll put down subscripts and what each of the I's are. So area is basically area of water plane. AWP represents area of water plane. H in this case is this distance. This perpendicular distance between the two axes. All right, now let's think very carefully about which of the Y bar or Y we should put with, with these eyes. So what should this guy be? Uh, 
this i is associated with which axis? Is it associated with y bar or y? With y. All right, you say this is associated with y. Why do you say that? Uh, because I'm probably wrong. I think it does go, it's the axis that goes through the center of mass. So I can go say y bar. All right, yeah, so second uh, answer correct. This is I, Y bar. Remember, it's always centroid I plus area H squared. We know our centroid axis is Y bar, so this has to be Y bar. And the other guy is I, Y. Does this make sense? This Y is not, does not pass through the centroid. So um, that, that's why if you want to compute I of that, it would have to be I of centroid plus A H squared. All right. Usually um, when we do the computation numerically, it's easy to compute I Y because you have, it's your choice where you place it, whether you place it at, at a midships fore or aft. Uh, and once you compute that, this guy is unknown. I Y bar is what is usually unknown. Make sense? Okay, uh, and again, we'll do an actual numerical example. So hopefully all of this becomes better and better. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, and just to uh, parallel axis theorem you've used before, just, just as a recall example, let's talk about a simple rectangular shape. Let's say this is the X axis. This is the Y. And we want to rotate this square flap about X prime axis, not about the centroid, okay? Um, Height is H, base is B. So if you remember all of your uh, nice tables from statics, you, you might remember that I, X, in this case, X goes through the centroid. So I, X is B, H cubed over 12. Okay, so you can compute that using integration as we've seen or you can look that up in, um, in, in from a table for this easy simple shape. Now if we don't want to rotate this about the mid, mid, mid axis but about this edge axis we would need I X prime. All right and we just use parallel axis theorem because this edge axis is parallel to the centroid axis. So this would be whatever goes through the centroid plus area time distance. Okay, now don't confuse the H. Uh, distance between the axes is H over two. So A times H over two whole squared. Okay. So is B H cubed over 12 plus B H times H squared over four, uh, B H cubed over three. Uh, yes, wait, wait, one, three, three, one, four, four by three, yeah. B H cubed over three. Okay, so that again, you've seen probably a while ago in statics.
Okay, any questions about anything? We'll move on to three-dimensional hulls now, and where we will start working with uh, the 3D examples. All right, let's keep going. So when we have three-dimensional all shapes. Just like we've been talking about area for uh, um, certain cuts. Now we, since we have three dimensions, talk about the volume. So volume. And remember, knowing the volume of the hull at least the submerged volume is important because that tells you how much buoyant force you have supporting you. So volume um, to find um, total submerged volume. Um, let me see. Okay, fine. All right, this remote control is basically a box, right? Uh, yeah, let's uh, ignore the curved edges. So volume, finding volume of this is very easy. You just need length times width times height. But that's not the case when we talk about the hull. Um, the submerged volume keeps changing depending on what your water level is, where your water line is. So, um, uh, and and of, of course the hull is not straight sections, but it's, it's, uh, it has a lot of curvature in many, in, all three directions, X, Y, and Z. So um, to find this total submerged volume, we cut a small volumetric element. And integrate over the entire hull. Whenever we were talking about area under the curve, what would we do? We would cut a two-dimensional strip. With a two-dimensional strip, you have the area of a 2D strip. In 3D, we cut not a strip, but like a very thin slice of the object. Uh, and we can compute the volume of that slice. That's, that's what this statement says. So let me draw a hull again. And let's draw a simple canoe shaped hull. All right, and I'll only draw one side solid. The other side, we know it exists, but we'll leave it undrawn. Here, I'll just draw it dashed, but from in later images, I'll, I'll leave that part undrawn. All right, and um, this is again the top view. And we might have, let's say, Y axis located here and Z coming out of the plane. Great. 
So again, the location of this y-axis is up to you, whether you want to put it all the way aft, all the way forward, or at the LCF, or at the, uh, at, at amidships. It's whatever is convenient you use. All right. So that axis basically defines where my x equals zero, and then we move forward and negative. And um, okay. Uh, huh. All right. Let's see. How do I? Okay, fine. I should have brought my shape. All right, let's imagine this is my ship, and that's the uh, four. This is the aft. What I'm trying to draw now is what happens if we slice this vertically. Okay. When we slice this vertically, what do you get? You get a thin cross-sectional slice, cut, okay? Um, you, the area of that cut is basically the area of that cross-section at that location. As we move forward or backward, that area, cross-section, will keep changing. If we know the area of that slice, how do we compute the volume associated with that slice? Does it make sense what I just said? Um, slicing this up along stations? Uh, you take the area, which is going to be, a, I guess, a function of x, and you multiply that by um, uh, dx dy, or delta x delta y, uh, to get the volume. All right, um, you're partially correct. So if you know, so first, um, what, what, what you mentioned about the area being a function of x, uh, that's, again, important to visualize. So if I take area over here versus area over here, you see they're very different slices. So the area varies as x, as he mentioned. Now, if I know the area of a slice, I just need the thickness of that slice. If I know the thickness, multiply area by that thickness, you get volume of that slice. Okay, I mean, think about slicing an apple, uh, very, very thin strips. You, you, get, you get a nice area, but a very, very thin thickness, okay? So it's not zero, it's some finite value. Uh, that, that basically gives us the volume of this very thin strip. And if we have a thousand different cuts along the ship, we just sum up all of the individual tiny volumes. That gives us the full volume. All right. So in this case, that's, that's what I'm trying to depict here. Uh, my... Uh, I'm slicing just like I was showing you with the stapler. Remember, this is the top view. So you, you're slicing all the way through the hull, all the way to the bottom. And we will call this area section at some X location. Okay, it's a function of X, so area section. Remember, sections are these vertical cuts. Okay, and in this case, we would have a thickness dx. So in, in this situation, we can write the volume is equal to triple integral of dv. dv is the volume of these tiny slices. And of course, you can ex do it by expanding this into dx, d, dy, dz putting down the correct limits. Or alternatively, we can do what we just said. We can say, all right, 
dv is basically a s x times dx right area of the slice times the thickness of the slice and you integrate all the way from x equal um, aft to 4 and i'm just writing aft to 4 because here i don't know what this might be negative 5 meters that might be plus 10 meters i don't know so to keep it general aft to 4 does this make sense Is, is this the only way to compute the volume? What other way can you think of? So I told you I sliced this in uh, along the sections, uh, along the stations. Is that the only way you can do this? You can make your uh, slices horizontal. Yeah, you can slice along the water uh, lines, right? So you can start at the keel and go up slicing this way. Uh, you will get uh, the, the same thing, okay? And the answer, of course, will be slightly different because numerical integration involves some error, but uh, um, it'll be almost the same value for the volume that you get. Okay. Um, so, um, That, that, that's basically another way you can do this. And let me let me make a sketch that depicts that. So alternative alternatively. We could slice it up along the water plane areas. Well, hey, you know what I mean. So um, instead of I should say water lines, but yeah, just to make it obvious, instead of slicing along the stations. All right, so let me draw, draw a side view of the same ship. Okay, that's the top view. When you look from a drone or a helicopter, uh, side view would be this. So same ship, instead of top view, we're looking at it from the side. X again, pointing along the four direction. Look at Y and Z. So Z points uh, along the top, Y points into the plane. That's the X, uh, that's the X with the circle. What, that's what that means. Here, Z points out of the plane. And this is necessary to maintain a right-handed coordinate system. Uh, yeah, again, I hope you remember what that means. So in, in this scenario, what we can do is instead of cutting along the sections, just like you said, we cut along the water plane, the water lines. So we have this, this very thin slice 
All right. What do we call this? A W P and it's what do you say it's a function of? Is it is it a function of X, Y, or Z? Z. Yeah, it's a function of Z because depending on the different Z coordinate, the area the cut would change. So the area of your cut would change. All right, and then in this case, our thickness is dz. So this is our other expression for volume. Um, you can do volume is area WP as a function of z dz. What are the limits? What are the lower and upper limits in this case? I guess the distance from the water line to your keel line. Yeah, you start um, at the, well, yeah, you, you start at the keel and you go up to the water line. And remember, the, um, if, if our axis uh, is at the water line, this distance from keel to water line is called the draft T. Okay. Uh, oh, this symbol means that's the water line. Okay. And um, so keel would be at Z equal negative T since we've placed our x-axis right at the water line, and you would go up to z equals zero. Okay, and in this case, you we remember we also call this nabla. This is the submerged volume or the displacement. Okay, so th that's how you would compute volume. You either slice it along uh, the different sections and take your thin slices, integrate, or you slice it along the water plane, take your thin sections, thin slices, and integrate from the top, uh, bottom to the top. Okay. Once you find the volume, uh, you are able to say, all right, this is the weight I am carrying because that has to equal the volume, the displacement of the water, the weight of the water displaced. Um, another important thing that we need to consider when talking about volume computations is the center of buoyancy. And the reason you need that is the buoyant forces, your upward pointing force, acts through that point, the center of buoyancy, okay? And we can compute it again using integration. So center of buoyancy, and we will denote this by capital B and this point, the center of buoyancy coincides with the center of volume of the submerged hull. So it's located at center of submerged volume of the body.
Just like we have an LCF, we have an LCB. Longitudinal center of flotation was LCF. We can talk about an equivalent thing called the LCB, longitudinal center of buoyancy. So um, the longitudinal center of buoyancy. LCB. And again, this can be with respect to uh, the y axis located at midships, or it can be with respect to the aft or the fore. Y axis located at midships. All right, and um, remember if, if we had different objects glued together, we, we talked about how to compute the area centroid. This is X1, A1 plus X2, A2, blah, 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 divided by total area. Same thing applies for central buoyancy. So you, you, you would um, have, um, um, XB is X1, B1 plus X2, V2 plus dot, 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 dot. And these V, the Vs basically represent, remember these slices we were cutting, that, that would be the volume of each of the slices. This would be the X location of the LCB of each of the slices not the LCB, the volume center of each of the slices. So in integral form, you could just write this as triple integral of X dV over dV. Similarly, we have Y V is triple integral of Y dV remember this this whole thing evaluates to nabla the total submerged volume If, if you're symmetric, which of these is zero? X, B, Y, B, Z, B. If your hull is perfectly symmetric about the longitudinal axis. Your hull looks like this from the top. What can you say? So uh, with, with the area, it was pretty uh, intuitive and obvious. Uh, if, the, uh, if the object is symmetric, well, if the plane is symmetric, you know the centroid has to lie along this center line. Think about the volume. The volume is symmetric, meaning if you slice your hull straight down along the center line, the volume on that side that half is exactly equal to the volume on, on this half. What can you tell me about the center of volume? Which one is zero? Is it XB, YB, or ZB? Mm 
shooting then maybe didn't make sense uh, okay so let's talk about this guy all right you see this thing is more it's almost perfectly symmetric if i take a knife and slice it along the middle here top to down okay that's what we're talking about. Our, our ships basically look like this, unless you have an aircraft carrier or some, something else. Uh, they're almost always symmetric about this vertical center line. This, this line, you see the crack here? So what can you tell me about the volume center? Which value will be zero? YC, XC, or Z? <laughs> YB, XB, or ZB? X points in this direction, Y points in that direction, Z points out of the plane. It'll be YB. Yeah, exactly. So remember, Y is this axis, right? The lateral axis. So we know since this is perfectly symmetric, why doesn't it look? Okay. It's perfectly symmetric. If I take a knife and slice it down, that way volume of the object on the upper uh, on one half is exactly equal to volume of object on the other uh, other half so the center of volume has to lie along my pen somewhere okay it has to lie on this axis so y coordinate yb is equal to zero xb we don't know zb we don't know so xb would be what's the x coordinate of the volume center ZB would be, let me flip the hull. ZB would be where from the keel is the volume center. So here, looking at this guy, is somewhere here, right? So that vertical height is ZB. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So, um, yeah, so the, the, uh, y, YB instead of doing the computation, if you know your hull is symmetric, so it's zero if um, say metric about the center line. Okay, perfect. So, uh, All right, all right, uh, one more thing. So uh, these triple integrals, uh, let's uh, simplify them a bit. So X, B, all right, fine. Let's go look at, um, let's go back and look at our, this sketch here. So you remember when we were just talking about computing the volume is just, area of this slice, the three-dimensional slice times the width, that's what goes in here. We had a triple integral of dv. Now we have something slightly different. In the numerator, we have triple integral x dv. What would you do? How would you change this to account for that? First, think about what it means in terms of the slice. So this slice, how does x dv integrate? What does that mean? Is it, are you able to visualize what's happening? No, okay. Mm. All right, so this integral makes sense. That's what we talked about. Volume, total volume is triple integral of dB, which is just summing up the individual volumes of the slices. Individual volumes of slices is what we have written here. Area of the cross section times thickness of the cross section. Now, instead of just dB, we have an X inside. That's what we're trying to talk about now. How would you change this integral, the one on the bottom? 
to account for that. If you have an x times dv, what do you write on the bottom? dv, the volume of the slice, three-dimensional slice, is area of the slice times dx. Now I put something in front, x times that. So we can just write x times all of this, okay? That, that's basically it. It's the same as we do with um, moment of inertia. Double integral of y squared dA becomes something, something. So same thing here. Triple integral of x times dv becomes x times all of this. So this guy just simplifies to x equal f to 4 um, x ax dx divided by nabla. Uh, and uh, nabla is what you evaluated the one. Does this make sense? Tell me now if it doesn't make sense. It's important to visualize this and really get this down in your mind. Is it making sense? What we just did? Yes, no, maybe, somewhat. Not really. It's making sense. Okay, okay. I, I want maybe or there's a little bit some that something's off. Nobody? Okay, then you tell me what this simplifies to, ZB. Look at this second picture I've made and you tell me what, what we would write for, um, yeah, what would we write for a ZB? You have everything you need here. Okay, so that means it's not making sense, all right? So please tell me what, what doesn't make sense. Any, unless you tell me what, where you're confused, I cannot um, explain that specific part. Or none of it makes sense, explain everything from the beginning. That's fine too, but you have to tell me. If this doesn't make sense, you will be lost for the rest of the course. So that's why I really want you to tell me now. Okay, so nobody, come on, please. Could you uh, go over what the B represents again? Sure. So um, B is what we call center of buoyancy. So let's say if you have a block of wood that's floating in water, what this B represents in that case is however much your block is submerged, think of, visualize that as a new box, right? A rectangular or a cuboid box. And you find the center of that box. That's very easy to do, right? It's just length over two, uh, L over two, B over two, H over two for a box. Make sense? Yes. So for a box floating in water, this is very easy to compute. The submerged part of the box, uh, you treat as a new box, B over two, H over two, gives you the exact location of this. 
with the hull, that's not as easy because the hull has curvature. Uh, uh, okay, see, I, I make gestures and I forget that you can't see me. So the hull has uh, curvature as you go from the deck to the keel, okay? Also, when you go from the fore to the aft, it has a different fineness. So it, its curvature keeps changing. So same thing as a box of wood floating in water, our ship is floating in water. But we are only concerned with the submerged part, whatever is underwater. So we cut, we slice the entire ship along the water plane and discard everything that's above water. Okay, now we basically have, again, this is just us imagining things. So now we have like a um, section of the hull that's submerged. We need to find the center of this hull the center of volume of this hull. If the hull were a perfect rectangular object, easy over two, uh, H over two. But now not simple. So that's where we have to do this integration. But what we are trying to find is exactly the same thing. The center of the volume. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Okay, okay. So conceptually, that's all we are trying to do. The way we do that mathematically is what I've written here. Um, yeah, so the way, the way we do that mathematically, find the center of buoyancy is by evaluating all of these equations. Um, if we have, a, okay, let me switch again. If we have two different objects, this stapler and this pen, and I glue them together. The center of volume of the combined thing would be what the force formula says. So it's just, if you know center volume of one object and of the second object, you just do some, the, the summation shown in the first line. So that's this. Mm, yeah, that's this first line here. If you have two objects, you only have the first two numbers, this guy and that guy. If you have more objects, you keep adding. That's how you get the center, volume center coordinates. You do the same for X, Y, Z, same thing, okay? Instead of X, you put Y1, Y2, instead of, or if you want ZB, you put Z1, Z2. Is that okay? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, In, um, so that, that's what happens if we have discrete objects glued together. For a hull, you can think of, you start breaking apart the hull and treat each individual uh, br broken part as an object. And then you glue everything together to form the hull. So in essence, you can use the same formula for doing that. And in continuous form, this formula looks like this integral here. Integrating in all three directions because we have to deal with the full volume. So this is integrating in X, Y, and Z, okay? And you, you see the formula here is exactly the same as what's on top. And the same thing applies for X as Y as Z, all right. So the formula is fine. Now we need to think about how to, this is a very general form that's given. How do we make this more useful to us? Then we go back to, all right, if we were given a hull, we would have sliced it in our head along the stations, right? The, from top to bottom or along the water plane areas. Fine. If I take the first guy, slice it along the stations. Uh, okay, so now uh, hopefully cent center of buoyancy, the meaning of B makes sense. Tell me one thing, does this make sense? What happened here? If that makes sense, the other one will make sense too. So I, I will explain this again 
uh, if, if it's not 100% clear. Yeah, it makes sense. It's uh, you're changing volume into area times length, basically. Yeah, it's area times the thickness. That's that's the volume. dv uh, uh, in words, dv just means volume of the elemental cut. Uh, that's our apple slice that we have cut. So uh, that dv just becomes this thing here, and. Since it changes only in the x direction, we know we need to start at one end of x and start moving and end up at the other end. Of course, you can go the other way. You will just get a negative sign, but that's fine. So that, that's all that this represents. Now, the next thing we need to think about is, okay, now I have this new integral. The bottom is exactly the same as what's written here, but the top, is slightly different. It has an x times dv, okay? Now, if it makes sense that you can change dv to this a times dx, the same exact thing happened here. dv is a times dx, the x comes down as it is, okay? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, help me figure out what, what should happen to the, the Z coordinate of uh, B. How, how do we simplify this? Anal it, 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 it'll be analogous to what we did for X. Okay, so what, what do you think we should do? Let's look at the bottom guy first. Does this look similar to something we've written here? Is it similar to this guy? Volume, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is triple integral of volume. I, I told you this is an alternative way. We can slice it up in the water plane. So volume is just area of, again, the slice of the water plane times thickness of the water plane, going from the keel all the way to the water line. So this is um, the integral if you do it in the z direction. You don't have to, you can do it in the x direction, like on the top of the page. Um, but it, it's perfectly fine to do it this way. Now think about if this is dv, a times dz is dv, how can we simplify Z times DV? Ooh, there's a chat. Okay, so in chat, somebody said A times DZ, A W P Z D Z. Okay, okay, fine, fine, all right. Okay, all right. So um, Z times DV would just be Z times this thing inside. As we said, this is dv. So we write this as z times a w p times dz. And this time we go from keel to the water line. So that's it. And it's, again, it's equivalent to what we were talking about on the previous page. Uh, read through all of this very, very carefully. Um, and and because it, it's very important to get this very ingrained, almost become second nature to you. Uh, okay. So we're out of time. So we'll do the numerical example next class where we actually solve these things by using trapezoidal rule that we learned about. Do you have any questions? Again, please read it through this at home and um, uh, you want me to explain again, I will do it next class. Because this is basically the essence of everything we build up on. Would it be possible to uh, post these notes? Yeah, I, I will scan these notes uh, again because it's so important. I'll, I'll break my regular uh, 
rule and I'll, I'll post this online. So again, promise me you'll, you will look through them and you will ask me things that don't make sense. Uh, I'm, I'm posting the Thank notes. You. Yeah, I'm posting the notes exactly for that. So you ask me about things that don't make sense. Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll, we, we'll keep going next class. All right, so yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys then. All right, thank you. Have a good one. Yep, bye.